last week, and uh, we're, so we'll pick up in 10 tonight. Uh, but what he had been saying to them, basically, was he said, I'm not talking to a people that haven't seen the miraculous power of God at work. I'm, I'm not talking to your kids that haven't seen it and didn't know it. I'm talking to you. And you've seen what God does to people like Dathan and Abiram who acted out in rebellion against what God has established. And, and, so, uh, and, 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 and so he's saying, therefore, keep, keep the commandments. Just, just keep the commandments. This is the covenant. He's giving you the commandments. Keep the commandments. Now, we talked about that that's not a small chore. Matter of fact, it's impossible. We just can't do it, not consistently. We can't attain righteousness that way. But there's some couple of pictures that are painted here uh, that, that I think are noteworthy for the church. And so let's just dive in. Oh, let, let's, let's pray and ask for some help. I know we already did that, but I want to do it again. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, it's too much for me. It's too much for us. And so we pray for your Holy Spirit, uh, the bearer of truth, the spirit of truth, the one who guides us into all truth. And we pray that your spirit uh, would uh, interpret your word to us and help us to apply it here tonight. And we love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, verse 10, chap Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 10. And he says... Uh, for the land which you go to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you have come, where, where you sowed your seed and watered it by foot as a vegetable garden. Now, <clears throat> I didn't understand what that meant, and so I did some research and dug around into it a little bit. And at that time in Egypt, uh, if, you, they, they, if they wanted to irrigate their garden, there were a couple of different options here. They had some uh, pumps that they had built that were foot-powered, like you could pedal them like a bicycle or you could, you know, do like this. They even had one w with what I saw that was like a treadmill, you know, and I don't know if that was like the one where you do this or, or, or if it was just a regular treadmill, but it would power the pump that pumped the water to irrigate the garden. Also, they would take their their heel of their foot and drag it through their garden and make a water furrow and then they would do well I've seen it done out west where they have a flume ditch and either it stays full of water and they had these aluminum tubes uh, that you would take and put down in the water and suck it up a couple of times and throw it over the levee and it would run for as long as that ditch had water in it I've actually done that out west they this farmer let us do that so it could be that to where they took their foot and dug a trench for the water to water the garden. Anyway, uh, that's irrelevant, but I thought it was interesting. But verse 11, But the land which you cross over to possess is a land of hills and valleys which drinks water from the rain of heaven, a, a, a land for which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning of the year to the very end of the year. And so you see the contrast, the, the picture that he's, okay, so you've got an Egypt mindset right now. And this little vegetable garden you had over there, and he wasn't saying that it didn't rain in Egypt. It's going to rain here. He wasn't saying that. This is where your mind is. It's in this little vegetable garden where you've got to take your foot and dig trenches to get it watered and irrigated. That's where your mindset is. And the Lord has so much more, such a greater land for, in mind for you to put, a land that, that He's not just going to put you out there like Pharaoh did, to where you've you got to tend to this garden and make sure that it gets watered and you're tending and taking care of it all yourself. No, He's got a great land, a land of hills and, and, and it's prosperous, a land that flows with milk and honey in mind for you. That the Lord's eyes are always. It's easy to get there before we get to pointing fingers. It's easy to get there. Brian was talking about it this morning. It's easy to get wrapped up in the things of this world. And I'm not, I'm not anti, an, anti uh, any of the nice things that God has given us to enjoy. But you can't make that all it's about. 
because that's tunnel vision, just like them. You can't have that vegetable garden mentality here when, what was it Paul said? He said, eye hasn't seen and ear hasn't heard and neither has it entered into the heart of man all that God has in store for those who love Him. And so we need to expect the prayer of Jabez. You remember the prayer of Jabez where he said, Enlarge your tent and stretch out the cords and open your mind. You've got a mighty God. <laughs> uh, an awesome God. That we're and He's got plans for us and a, and a land for a life for us, spirit-filled life for us to possess. And he's, we've got the hope of the eternal. And we're... Here, a lot of times, stuck in, well, I'm not getting my way right now. I'm, I'm the world's worst on the road. Why, why aren't they doing this like I think they ought to do it? And why are they, in, you know, like the world's got a conspiracy to inconvenience me. You see what I'm saying? The vision's too small. It's, 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 it's not about this. And the Lord has given us all things to enjoy. And, I, and, I, and I, I've, got, I've, got a lot, I've got a lot of things, to, and you do too, that we're blessed, man. we got jobs, and we got income, and we got homes, and we got clothes on our back, and cars to drive, and we got a lot to enjoy. We just need to remember who gave us that. Who provides that for us and not have the vegetable garden mentality? Okay? Verse uh, 13. And, and it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today, to, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, then I, if you were reading an NASB, it says he, and I think that he is more appropriately, but I looked into this too because it confused me. It sounds like Moses is saying that he would give me the rain, but it's not. That Hebrew word that's used there is in the first person tense. Uh, if anything, he might have been quoting God saying that he would give. Okay, so anyway, we'll read it like it reads in the NASB. Then verse 14, then he will give you the rain for your land in its season, the early rain and the latter rain. Anybody know much about farming? You, know, you need to have the early rain and the latter rain, don't you, Ron? Because if you miss one of them, if you miss the early rain, it's not going to form, and if you miss the latter rain, it's going to burn up. And so he's saying that God is going to provide everything in this agricultural environment to where the wealth was accumulated through the products that agriculture produces, produces, that God is not going to go halfway with you here. If you'll get on board with Him, then He's going to take care of you and He's going to do it thoroughly all the way through. Verse 15. Oh, wait, I didn't read all of it. Then, I, then he will give you the rain for your land in season, early rain and in the latter rain, that you may gather in your grain, your new wine, and your oil. That's prosperity. That is provision. That speaks of the complete provision of God. Verse 15, and I will send grass in your fields for your livestock. <laughs> That you may eat and be filled. So I'll feed your livestock so you can eat them and I'll just take care of everybody is what the Lord's saying. Take heed to yourselves lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. <clears throat> I don't know if I've stressed this enough but as I'm seeking understanding as we go through here, uh, I see more and more clearly all the time that this idolatry is a very personal thing to God. He views that through several of the prophets as adultery, that Israel had committed adultery. Well, you know how hurtful that is. You know how painful that is. You know how... How, uh, how uh, humiliating that can be. And, and, and that's many times what we do to God by putting other things before Him. Now, this isn't a guilt trip. 
And, and this isn't, I'm not standing up here like somebody that's righteous. I'm just saying that we need to be mindful of this and making the application. Learning from Israel, you know, Hebrews says that these things happen to them as an example so that we could learn from it. And so let's learn from it because it's chasing idols. Okay, so did you notice that in order to get to, uh, it, okay, let's read it again. Take heed to yourselves lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside aside from God, that you take your attention, your focus, your allegiance, and your trust, and your hope, and your faith from Him, and serve other gods and worship them. Lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you, and He shut up the heavens so that there be no rain, and the land yield no produce, and you perish quickly from the good land which the Lord has given you. Uh, and so, the Lord has this wonderful land uh, in mind, this promised land, this land that flows from, with milk and honey that he promised Abraham. And Moses is warning them and saying, so well, I, I just want you to love the Lord and, and get in a relationship with them. That's what the, the commandments are supposed to do. You were supposed to struggle with it for a little while and realize I can't do it. Hit your knees and say, I need a Savior, God. And, and I need your mercy. You remember the Pharisee and the uh, tax collector that were in the temple and the Pharisee came in and he's, uh, he's watching and this guy's beating his chest and saying, God, be, be merciful to me, the sinner. Remember that? And the Pharisee said, Oh, Lord, I want to thank you that I'm not like this guy. <laughs> But this, Jesus said it, this guy, he walked away justified. This guy, he don't get it. He didn't get what the law was supposed to do. Drive us to our knees. Tell us we can't make it. I can't do it, Lord. I don't know how. I'm not good enough. I'm not righteous enough. I'm not perfect enough. I can't keep it to attain the righteousness that you require out of me. I need a Savior. Therefore, verse 18, you shall lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul and bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up, and when you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates, verse 21, that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land of which the Lord swore to your fathers to give to them, like the days of the heavens above the earth, verse 22, for if you carefully keep all these commandments, which I command you to do, to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to hold fast to him, then the Lord will drive out all these nations from before you and you'll dispossess greater and mightier nations than you. Every place on which you, the sole of your foot treads shall be yours from the wilderness and the Lebanon and Lebanon from the river, the river Euphrates, even to the western sea shall be your territory. They never possessed all that. <clears throat> They never really believed God. Some of them did, some of them didn't. In the old covenant, there were believers and unbelievers, just like there is here today. Right? Because some of the people were honest and truthful, and they said, I can't do it. I, I just can't do it. I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't be righteous before you, God. I need help. I need a Savior. I need a Redeemer. I'm going to go to hell if I don't have your salvation. I need your mercy. That was the purpose of the commandments, to show us we can't do it. That was the purpose of the priesthood, to show us that we need a mediator. We need someone to make atonement for us. Now, we talked about the shadow, remember? The old covenant was a shadow. It was a shadow of Jesus. Lots of folks, I've been guilty of it, trying to hang out in the shadow. And it's a very frustrating experience. We never do really get to the substance, to the fullness of the Godhead that dwells in Christ Jesus. 
Now, did, did God say that if, if, if you'll just hit your knees and beg for mercy that Jesus didn't need to die on the cross? No. No. Not at all. I, I want you to trust me while my plan is unfolding on the timeline of time and history because I've got this working in a direction and at the perfect time the Bible says he came and God, God great is the mystery of God and God was manifested in that's Jesus the blood of bulls and goats could never atone for sin and no just no flesh shall ever be justified by the works of the law but it all had purpose now, why did he take so long to bring it all out and unfold? I don't know, but I'm not questioning him. Remember where we started in this book? God's sovereign. I'm just going to do this his way. He's not my servant. I don't get to ask him why. I just submit. The psalmist said, my times are in your hands. I can't help myself. Now, I, I, so with all that, and I probably jumbled it all up again. However, with all that being said and considering all that, what's missing? What's missing? There were people who believed they... They, 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 they understood that even if they didn't understand that that was the purpose of the law, they understood that they couldn't do it. And so they cried out for mercy and they believed God and they became a friend of God through what God had promised he was going to bring about in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Same thing, Abraham, before the law. He believed God. God credited to him as righteousness. He was called a friend of God based on his faith. I believe you. I don't understand it. I don't know how it's doing, but I know I can't help myself, and I need you and your plan, so help me understand your plan and be in a relationship with you. What's missing for the ones who couldn't get there? What's missing here in this scene where he told them, he said, uh, write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates that your days and your days of your children be multiplied. Do all these things. What, 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 do you understand what the problem was? Because they did all these things. They did more. Let's read some more. And so... Yeah, that God, if, that if you keep these commandments, that God will put the fear and dread of you on the land. A fear upon all the land where you tread, just as he said to you, Behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the commandments, and that is true. If you could obey the commandments, you would be blessed and you'd be righteous and you'd be holy and you would be okay. But we can't do it. And so it, it, the blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after other gods which you have not known. Now, it shall be when the Lord your God has brought you into the land which you go to possess that you shall put the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. Are they not on the other side of the Jordan toward the setting of the sun in the land of the Canaanites who dwell in the plain opposite Gilgal beside the terebinth trees of Morah? For you will cross over the Jordan and go in to possess the land which the Lord your God has given you, and you will possess it and dwell in it, and you shall be careful to observe all the statutes and the judgments which I set before you today. So you're supposed to uh, uh, put, these, put this word on, on your head and, and, and in between your eyes and on your hands and on the doorposts of your house, and you're supposed to tell your children about these commandments, and you're supposed to go through here, and you're supposed to look at Mount Gerizim and pronounce the, the blessing. Mount Gerizim was a very plush and uh, fertile Mountain is beautiful to look at, all kinds of vegetation. And Mount Ebal was barren and stony. As a matter of fact, Ebal means stony. It's dead. It's like a picture of the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. There's life and death. And they went through all the trouble of externally keeping all these things and doing all these things, but it didn't mean anything. He told them, put it on your head, put it between your eyes, put it on your hands. 
put it on the doorpost. And when you walk by here, pronounce blessing on Gerizim and cursing on Ebal. There's a blessing and a curse before you today. A blessing if you obey the law and a curse if you don't. And all these things happen. And they did these routine external rituals religiously. As a matter of fact, they had this big old elaborate scheme to where they have a guy or two go up on Gerizim and shout down, Blessed is Israel for keeping the commandments of the God. Blessed are you. They'd say, Amen. Amen. They'd have a guy go up on Ebal. Uh, uh, cursed are you if you don't obey the commandments of the Lord. And, Amen. Amen, brother. Missed it. Riding on the doorposts and the painting it on the rocks in the yard and they had the commandments written all over the... It was supposed to be an internal value that we gave to the love of God that we saw in the commandments. To when we realize that we can't do it, I need a Savior, and God shows us His mercy and helps us to believe in the promise that's coming. A promise that if we will put our faith in Jesus, it will take us into the eternal kingdom, and in Him we are saved. Because in the promised land, in the land that we possess, even us here today, the land, the life that we possess in Christ Jesus, through faith in Him. It's a land that's much greater than anything we've ever known before. We've got a vegetable garden with a trench that we've dug with our heel mentality when no eye has seen and no ear has heard and no heart has ever grasped all that the Lord, your God, has in mind for those who love Him. There was supposed to be an internal change. You see the blessing on Gerizim. It's a picture that's painted that in God, in life, there's safety and security. In this. It's plush and there's life. And in these idols, there's death and ugliness. It's stones. Don't let your heart be deceived by the enticements and the politics of the world system. Babylon is very much alive today. And if we drink that wine, Daniel said, no thanks. Without the love of God, Without his love on a personal level, without his blessing that only comes in the relation, when we're engaged with God in a relationship, then the love of God comes in and it changes everything. Paul said it in Corinthians, if I speak in the tongues of angels and of men and have not the love, the agape love of God, I'm just a noisemaker. If I can prophesy and tell all mysteries and do all... He's talking to a church in that day that was very... Was, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, rich with spiritual gifts. And they had all kinds of, of, of manifestations and things and impressive stuff going on. And he said, You're just like Israel. On the mountain doing the external, ritualistic, empty, religious practices and the activities and the stuff, but the love of God is absent. You're missing the point. And I don't want us to miss the point that we've got to engage with God through Jesus Christ in the honest truthful relationship I'm not trying to impress my friends by some gift that I do or don't have or what I'm not going up on Mount Ebal and say watch this I know how it's done because I did this last year with my buddies blessed are you for keeping the commandments they didn't keep the commandments they were lying amen cursed are you if you don't keep the commandments of the Lord amen Well, ever since the serpent caused the fall of humanity in the garden, 
We're all cursed. We come out of the womb that way. Cursed. In the Gospel, the gospel of John, I believe it's in chapter 3. Now, this is the condemnation that the light of the world, the light, the enlightenment, the hope, the grace and the forgiveness and the mercy of God that opens our eyes and allows us to see has come into the world. But men have rejected it because they preferred the darkness. It says because their deeds were evil. And, and I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, certainly not diminishing that or dismissing that. I know mine were. But if my heart got deceived, and it did, and I chafed after my idols and involved myself in a relationship with sorcery, with pharmacia, with the drugs and the alcohol, and my mind became reprobate, and things that shouldn't make sense did make sense, and things that shouldn't have made sense or should have made sense didn't make sense. If your heart becomes deceived, is what he told them, and you pull away from the living God, and you chase after these other gods, it's not God's going to get mad at you and He's going to curse you. No, the curse is already there. The How many of you know that if you engage in the crime, the consequences are already there in the universe just waiting for you to run into them? It took me years to finally learn that. I mean, about 50 years to finally learn The consequences are already set. When I engage in this behavior, it's coming. Well, I think I can just dabble with the pleasure. Maybe even make the easy money. But the consequences are attached to it in a package deal. And the only way out of that is to engage with the plan of God of grace and forgiveness and mercy that came if we engage and put our faith and our hope in the light that has come into the world and provided freedom from the condemnation and set us free so that we can observe and, 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 and do our best to keep the ways of the Lord instead of the ways of the world, instead of the ways that are familiar to me. You know, how many of you know that if we follow the path of least resistance, <laughs> it's not going to put us in a good place. I have to be intentional to choose the more difficult path some days and follow the Spirit that is working in tandem with the word and stay allegiant to God and his plan to redeem Adam through Israel to which I was adopted through Christ Jesus. I, I believe that's what he was saying to them. The, the pictures are painted. Life, death, God, other gods. However you want to look at that. Anyway, that's, that's what I got out of here. And it's, it's so easy. And, and, and I can admit, and I'll put this on my shoulders, that it's so easy to get wrapped up in and doing the activities and completing the rituals and to leave God completely out of my heart. Because I, I can make it look real good. You know, I can roll in off that truck and roll in here and do my stuff and show up when I'm supposed to and all that stuff. And there are times when I'm, I'm like... Lord, have I left you behind? H have I failed to give you my heart? Am I just doing the stuff? I mean, I'm in the routine and it all looks great. 
But in Israel, in the covenant people of God, there were believers and unbelievers, and you couldn't tell the difference in them because they were all doing the stuff. But there was an internal attitude, and there still is to this day, there's an internal attitude of submission and, and a hunger and a thirst for the righteousness of God in Christ that has to be there. And I have to nurture that. I got to feed that. You know, they say that, you know, the, that uh, if, with, when it comes to food, we'll quit here in just a second. If it comes to food, uh, the, 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 the longer you go without eating, the hungrier you get, you know. But with the Word of God, it's kind of the opposite. The longer you go without eating, the less you want to eat. And the only way to break through that is to intentionally sit down and cause myself to seek after Him. Through His Word, through prayer, through church attendance and fellowship and all the things that we enjoy with these resources that God has made available to us, the riches that are in Christ Jesus, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control that's available through the Spirit because of Jesus. And we find that sometimes we need each other. That's why we go to church, because we need each other. Not just for accountability, but sometimes for encouragement. And sometimes I'm encouraged without anybody ever saying a word. We need each other. They needed each other. It's why there was a temple. It's why they had public and corporate worship. And we have all that available to us today. But I would submit to you that if we're not careful and intentional to submit our hearts to Jesus, that it's very easy to do what they did. And say, so, well, I checked my list. I didn't commit adultery. And I ain't killed nobody. I'm okay. But do you know the Lord and is he involved in our daily affairs because I slack sometimes I get busy I get distracted I get whatever and it happened to me one day this week and I'll close I, I woke up one morning and it's kind of funny how many of you know that the Lord the Holy Spirit will be sarcastic with you sometimes Did you ever have that you ever have that happen is this just me am I crazy but I woke up early one morning and I was concerned about this because I was concerned that maybe I had been so distracted with trying to do better and trying to be a better kid for the Lord and all that stuff, but failing miserably along the way, you know, and I was like, you know, Lord, I don't know, am I just doing the stuff? Am I just doing what they're doing? What you're showing me here? Am I just completing the rituals and going through the, the stuff? And am I really, do I know you? Or am I fooling myself? Is this some uh, imagination that I have told myself? Or do I know you? And I was worried about it. I was even in tears. You know what I heard here? <laughs> You're having a two-way conversation with somebody. And I was like, well, okay. Okay. <laughs> You know, he does all the work. But I got to want him. Do we want him? I know we need him. But do we want him? Let's work on that. You want to? Because we don't want to be the external ritual keepers, do we? I want to be in a relationship with God. I need the real something.